Question number one. During an acquisition, the acquiring company finds that the target company still needs to perform regular vulnerability assessments or audits on its systems. Post-acquisition, what advanced steps should the acquiring company prioritize to demonstrate due diligence and align with industry standards? I know, I know. We whipped this sucker right out the gate from a policy perspective, not from a technical perspective. And believe it or not, yes, you need to know these. It is part of Security Plus. And no, I am not turning into a Marvel superhero. The the redness. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Some of you guys are probably looking at it going, man, red shirt, red face. Uh, yeah, I need to fix my camera settings. I, I screwed around with it for like an hour, and I finally gave up, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to record the videos. We'll, we'll deal. We'll deal. Uh, new office. We moved upstairs. Uh, my wife wanted more space for her craft room, and I got kicked out of my office because apparently I had to double the space. And so, yeah, that's what happens when you're married. It happens. Crafting over office work is what I was told. All right, let's answer this one. If you need more time, if you need more time, of course, you could pause the video. Uh, what are we looking at here? We need to find out. We need to find out if a company... Okay, let's just read the question, right? During the acquisition, the acquire company needs to find the target... Finds that the target company still needs to perform regular vulnerability assessments or audits in its systems or on its systems. Post-acquisition, what advanced steps should the acquiring company prioritize to demonstrate due diligence aligned with the industry standards? So we're saying that we were looking at it and we knew that we had issues, but we went ahead and bought the company anyway. So we already have the company. What do we want to do once, once we've acquired the company uh, and we control them? Uh, a, conduct a full risk assessment of the target company systems and update their policies, their security policy. Um, I like this answer. I really do. I, is it the best answer? I don't know. But it definitely is on my top of my list, especially if they haven't done any regular vulnerability testing or audits, right? Because full risk assessment, we find out what's going on, um, and then we can update their security policies to align to ours, uh, and then we can require them to do vulnerability assessments and audits in their systems. So I do like this answer. I really do. Uh, B, perform penetration tests and implement a vulnerability management program and log all findings. So we're going to do a penetration test. Implement a vulnerability management program to get those vulnerabilities in order and then move forward with fixing them and then log all the findings. Um, I'm not a big fan of this one. I'm not. Why would we pay a third-party company to do a penetration test or even do it on our front part? We already know that they're not doing vulnerability assessments. So I would I would do a vulnerability test. I don't know if I do a penetration test right at the bat. So B, I'm going to throw out the window. Uh, C, isolate the target company's network until a comprehensive security audit is completed. Uh, this one feeds into there. They definitely, they haven't done any audits. They haven't done any vulnerability assessments. Um, do we want to isolate them? I, I feel like we would. Is it better than A, though? Is it better than A? I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely up there. I like this one. C. Uh, D, mandate security awareness training for all employees and enforce stricter access. I mean, yeah, but it's not at the top of my list. Right, I, I would definitely mandate some security awareness training, but I feel like the IT department and the cyber department needs to get their act together before we start messing around with employees. And honestly, we probably already have that for our own employees, and if they're being acquired, then we'll probably expand that out to them because now there are employees as well. So I really don't know if we really need to mess with that. I, I'm, it's not a, fan. not a fan. So it's really between A and C. A and C are gonna be our top two answers. I'll give you about five seconds. If you had to pick between A and C, which one would you do? Which one would you do, A or C? All right, well, if you guessed C, isolate the target's company network until a comprehensive security audit is complete. Oh, absolutely. Heads and tails above the other one. Yes, we would want to conduct a risk assessment. We already know that they have got risks, right? We already know they haven't done any audits. They haven't done any vulnerability assessments. We are definitely not adding them to our network until we fix their crap. Uh, and so C, C is definitely going to be the correct answer on that one, 100%. We're not adding a vulnerability into our network until we until we can fix what we know is the problem and that's why c is going to be our best answer all right question number two let's see if i can't stump some people on this one a security analyst evaluates a vulnerability with a cvss vector string of av and you can read all that based on the vector string which of the following is the most critical recommendation to mitigate the risk and somebody's going to ask me do i need to memorize this is this important yes and i'll give you a hint av does not stand for antivirus i'll give you that one all right all right so we have four good answers on the board four good answers on the board um let's just just jump right into it let's just jump right into it let's start with a 
Restrict network access to the affected system to authorized users only. I feel like it already should be. Like, hello? Why Why is it not on authorized users only? I feel like that's a stupid question. Or I shouldn't say stupid question. I feel like that's a stupid answer. Like, I get it, but there's nothing in the question stating. And remember, CompTIA, they write their questions as in everything's perfect except what they tell you. Uh, and right now we just got this vector string, which we'll go over into in a minute. Uh, but I don't feel like A would be a good answer. Uh, B, patch the vulnerability immediately to prevent exploitation due to low complexity. I like this answer. Um, we definitely want to patch vulnerabilities as soon as possible, right? Um, definitely want to do that. But is it low complexity? Does that string tell us it's low complexity? That's a real good question. Uh, so B is a maybe. Maybe. Uh, C, disable the affected service and provide alternative workaround. Maybe on this one, too, because we have this vector string. We haven't identified what the vector string is. I mean, I know what it says. But have you? Do you know what it says? Um, disable the affected services and provide an alternative workaround. I mean, that's a good answer. It really is. Um, is it better than B? Maybe. Maybe. I, 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 would, uh, I would say maybe. Maybe. All right, D. Monitor uh, user interaction closely and restrict privileges to mitigate the impact. Of course, we always do that anyway. So A and D... I feel like are things that we should be doing anyway. And unless the question states otherwise, we have to assume that we do. All right, let's jump through, let's jump through this string, through this vector string, all right? AV, attack vector, all right? And then N, what's N stand for? Network. So we have an attack vector on the network. Then we have AC, right? Attack complexity is low. That's what that L stands for. Then we have privileges required, none, which is a major issue. Then we have user interaction, UI is R, required, so it requires user interaction. Then we have scope, that's that S right there, that scope, and then we have a C next to it, change, All right? So this is, what does that mean? That means if the scope's change, right? Um, the vulnerability can affect the components beyond the initial target, is what it really, that's the official kind of, that means that if, if somebody gets into the vulnerability, right? Somebody takes advantage of the vulnerability, they can sidestep, they can get around to other machines, other programs, other applications, other hardware, right? Um, and that's what it says. And so that's a major problem. And then we have uh, C, confidentiality. How does it affect the confidentiality? Well, we see H, well, <coughs> excuse me. That must mean high, right? Oh yeah, definitely high. Definitely high on that perspective. And then we have availability. And that would be L, that stands for low, uh, which means it would cause partial disruptions in our system. So the C, confidentiality with the high, that means it would affect the confidentiality of the system high, which means it would, it would have a high impact, okay? So knowing that, knowing that, that coming between B and C, we would know that B is most likely the best answer. Why? Because patch the vulnerability immediately to prevent exploitation due to low complexity. And we already know that complexity is low, so why not C? disable the affected services, uh, and provide an alternative workaround. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Because we're always going to fix what we can first. Uh, and so you almost didn't need to need to read the vector string if you understood that we're always going to patch, unless the vector string says that we can't, uh, which very rarely, very rarely will it say that. But uh, B is going to be our right answer on this one. I hope you learned something on that one. All right, question number three, an enterprise wireless network uses e -E EAP, TTLS, uh, for client authentication. A penetration tester successfully intercepts network traffic and discovers an unencrypted phase two credential change, exchange, excuse me, which improvement would most effectively secure the authentication process. And so we've got EAP TTLS. Um, yeah, and so EAP TTLS, typical in wireless. Is it the best? I think if you've taken a class with me, you know it's not the 100% best, but it's, it's dang close. Uh, let's, let's answer this one. If you need more time, go ahead and pause the video. We can start with A, enforce certification validation on all client services during the EAP handshake. Uh, not a bad answer, not a bad answer. B, transition from EAP TTLS to EAP PEAP to ensure full encryption on the credential exchange. Well, if you've taken a class with me on wireless, you know that EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol Trans Tunnel Transport Layer Security, if I remember that one, is second highest on our list of awesome EAPs. That means PEEP is below that, which means PEEP is not 
something we would want to transition to. And so we could throw that out the window right off the bat. By the way, TLS, TLS, it's missing that T is actually better than EEP TTLS. Normally, there are some exceptions out there. Uh, C, enable mutual authentication, implement pre-shared keys for all clients. Oh, another good answer. I like this one. I really do. I like, I like mutual authentication. Big thing, right? Because we authenticate both the server and the client on that aspect of it, which is a something we should be doing. And then implementing pre-shared keys for all clients makes sense because then if we do pre-shared keys, we don't have to deal with it, right? Uh, and so C is a good answer. And then D, use 802.1x with a radio server to centralize authentication and log all access attempts. Uh, you should already be doing that. We're talking about wireless and we're talking about enterprise. So, huh? I feel like we're already doing that. We're already talking about it unless it says otherwise. So I don't, I feel like that's something to like kind of fool you. That's exactly what it's designed to do. It's, it's designed to make you go, oh, wait a second. I know my professor, or I know my class told me that's what I should be doing. So I'm going to. I'm going to go there. Well, yeah, you should be doing it. That's part of the process, right? Um, so it really comes between A and C. We're going to answer this one. Do we want to enforce the certificate validation on all client during uh, devices during the EAP handshake or enable mutual authentication and implement pre-shared keys for all clients? Well, if you know anything about TTLS, then you probably know that if we wanted to do mutual authentication, we would have to use TLS, EAP TLS, does mutual authentication. EPTTLS creates a tunnel first. You cannot, one of, one of the things about EPTTLS is it only authenticates the server. It doesn't authenticate the client. Well, technically it authenticates the client, not the server, excuse me, uh, because you're sending your username and password. So we're authenticating the client, but we can't enable mutual authentication through EPTTLS uh, without changing the protocol. That's not something we can do. And so the real answer is then going to be A, we're going to do A, enforce certificate validation on all clients. Um, just because it's impossible to do C on ETTLS. We'd have to switch over the protocol, uh, which is not an answer. Not something we can enable on TTLS. Uh, and so A, A is going to be the correct answer on this one. There we go. All right, question number four. A cybersecurity audit reveals that individuals posing as employees of a contracted cleaning service have accessed multiple sensitive areas. Ooh, sounds like A hit movie from like uh, Leverage or something. Uh, the attackers use realistic badges and uniforms to bypass security. Uh, which advanced measures should the organization implement to mitigate impersonation attacks? To mitigate impersonation attacks, what should we do? Uh, good question on this one. Hmm, what do we do when a movie comes to real life and we've got people posing in cleaning services, breaking into our buildings, um, and then use realistic badges and uniforms to bypass security. Wow, that, that sounds just something out of like a, out of a movie, doesn't it? All right, let's answer this one. If you need more time, of course, you can pause the video. Uh, a, real-time video verification is required for all third-party personnel entering the premises. Uh, okay, I don't, I don't, no, I don't see this as being, I, this, I mean, it will work well in movies, and I guess if we're dealing with a movie thing, maybe, but no. No, because we still have the same problem. We still have the same problem. I guarantee that somebody watched them come in on video camera, no less, and probably didn't even think twice about it. And they had badges as well, so it wouldn't. No one would check it out, and so that that doesn't really help us out anything. We we probably already had that in place, and it failed already once. We don't need to do it again. Uh, B implement biometric access controls combined with visitor logs at all entry points. I like biometric. I do. I just don't know. I've never been a big fan of visitor logs. And the reason I've never been a big fan of visitor logs is because a lot of times security doesn't enforce it. A lot of times people just write the scratch. You can't read it anyway. Um, I'm not a big fan of visitor logs. I'm really not. It re very rarely do visitor logs make any sense. Most of the time people don't even pay attention. Uh, but B, I like the biometric. I like the bet. I'm going to put that one on the back burner. All right, C. Establish unique RFID badges for contractors and mandate escort protocols for sensitive areas. I like this one too. I do. Because, let's see, excuse me. If if we establish those unique RFID badges, then with RFID, it's, it's again, it's a control. They've got the RF attached to it. Um, and so it's unique to every person. And so definitely something I could see. I like C as well. Uh, D, conduct unannounced drills to test employees' vigilance and their ability to recognize impersonators. Ah, uh, no, that's a waste of employees' time. Most of the time, they're going to be like, why am I here? What am I doing this? This is stupid. And it's not going to work anyway. Um, and so D, 
D is not going to be a good answer. So it really comes between B and C. It really comes between biometric and RFID. Uh, I'm sorry, biometric with visor logs and RFID. Uh, so you have about five seconds. Which one do you think is going to be the better one, B or C on this one? Well, if you said C, establish unique RFID batches for contractors. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. And yes, I did leave you astray. I 100% did. I'm a mean person. Biometrics! Biometrics. Why? RFID can be fooled. Uh, there's lots of ways to, to take advantage of RFID. There's lots of ways to clone it and to spoof it. But with biometrics, a lot harder. A lot harder to do. Biometrics can be the right answer. Just because I don't like visitor logs doesn't mean we shouldn't use them. Biometrics was the key on this one. Uh, so that's going to be question number four. Question number five. During a physical security assessment, an organization's perimeter is observed to have inconsistent lighting coverage with blind spots in key areas. Analysis reveals that low wattage fixtures are used and motion activated lights are often delayed. Which actions would best uh, address these vulnerabilities while minimizing operational costs? What do you think on this one? You now, this one's a little bit weird, a little bit harsher on this. What do you think? I like this question though. I like. I feel like this one is actually pretty decently rough for something that's so easy with lighting as being our our way to get in. Uh, if you need more time, let's pause the video. We're gonna go ahead and answer this one. A. Replace all low wattage fixtures with high intensity floodlights and install continuous lighting systems. I thought we wanted to minimize operational costs. Oh my gosh! Could you imagine replacing everything with floodlights that are operating twenty four seven? Yeah, not not gonna minimize operational costs. That is for sure. Light electricity is expensive. All right, let's let's move on. B, deploy infrared motion activated lighting and integrate it with perimeter surveillance systems. Um, you do realize, oh, operational costs. I was gonna say you do realize that motion activated lighting costs some money, right? But they did they did specifically say operational costs, not costs as a whole. Um, so B B is a answer that might work. I don't know, man. Replacing all my lights. That, that could get expensive. All right, C, implement a layered lighting strategy using high-intensity LEDs with a line with motion detection zones and uh, with security patrol routes. Um, okay, so we're going to have layered lighting strategy to make sure that that way if one light goes out and another one kicks on, we're going to use high-intensity LEDs, which are a little bit more energy efficient, um, and then align the motion detection zones with security patrol routes so our, so our guards are going to be walking around. I feel like this is like, when they say high intensity LEDs, I feel like that's another way of saying, like trying to trick you. You know what I mean? But let's let's put it on the back burner. Let's put it on there as possible uh, until we see D. Let's see what D says and maybe we'll throw that one out. Uh, use solar powered lights to eliminate blind spots and rotate security cameras for broader coverage. Uh, all right, here's my problem with solar powered lights, all right? They don't normally work. Uh, trees grow and then people don't trim them properly or it's a cloudy day for several days in a row. Uh, unless you're living in like Arizona or sunny California, I just don't, I don't think solar lights are going to be the right answer. So I guess, I guess it's really between B and C and I hope I didn't give the answer away. Uh, it's really between B and C. What do you think? I'll give you about five seconds between B and C. What do you think on this one? Hmm. B or C. Uh, if you said B, deploy infrared motion activated lighting and integrate it with perimeter surveillance systems, you'd be incorrect. And I hope I fooled you. I really do. I, it gives me a special joy in my heart when I fool students. We're going to implement a layered lighting strategy. Why? Because if one goes out, we have overlapping layers. That's the entire purpose, right? And so that will get rid of those blind spots that we were talking about. And then use high intensity LEDs. Yes, that is a thing. And align with motion detection zones with security patrol routes. And so we are having ultimate coverage for our, our entire layout, right? And which addresses all of our vulnerabilities. And it minimizes our operational cost by having those LEDs in there. C is going to be our right answer. I know some of you are probably really mad at me right now. That's okay. I'll get over it. Or you will. It'll be one or the other. But I hope I hope you learned something. That's what we're trying to get across. All right. Until next time.